This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. And by Cafe Himbo Cookbooks, celebrating his 10th anniversary. Thank you. Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and stranger in a strange land. Bollywood is an area of cinema I don't know a whole lot about, but kind of wish I did. The reasons should be obvious. Music is deeply ingrained in Indian film to the point that songs from movies are a significant portion of the country's popular music, and while the performances of these songs are distinctly different from what we might find in an American-style book musical, their aesthetic has influenced musical sequences in several Hollywood films. There's clearly a rich history and culture here, and the thought of diving into it is somewhat intimidating. I do know one thing, though. Our next offender, Basmati Blues, is a very bad place to start. This 2017 mostly direct-to-stream movie has been promoted as a love letter to the Bollywood musical, a claim I find suspicious, as neither producer Monique Caulfield nor director-writer Dan Barron nor co-writer Jeff Dorchin had actually seen a Bollywood movie prior to making this. I have dealt with many passion projects that have gone wrong, but this may be the first time I've seen the exact opposite of one. Filming began in 2013 with a then-relatively unknown Brie Larson in the lead role, but was cut short due to the onset of monsoon season in India, forcing the filmmakers to raise more money to do a reshoot two years later. By the time the release rolled around, Larson had an Oscar and a spot in the Marvel stable to her name, so the producers were probably hoping on her increased clout to carry the film. Instead, they ran into a huge backlash as the trailer unleashed a flood of yikes for what looked to be a superficial story laden with cultural stereotypes and a white savior narrative. Which, well, we must examine the case of Basmati Blues to weigh those accusations. The movie begins with a cheap CGI space fly-through that makes me wonder if I've taken a wrong turn into a Neil Breen project. And apart from a few sitar and drum riffs, the music isn't putting me in mind of India, it's more like something you'll hear in the lower echelons of Christian pop. This may be understandable, as it's revealed Brie Larson is listening to this Inspiromatic 2000 composition while doing lab work. There's a time for letting go Larson plays Dr. Linda Watt, who works with her father Eric for a company called Mogul, which, as far as suspicious company names go, ranks just below Mega Evil Malicious Villainy Incorporated. Dad's exposition-heavy Skype call lets us know that the two of them have been working on the genetically modified Rice 9, which has proven super successful and is being introduced to farmers in India, and they're getting new research funding, and also Linda's dead mom would be so proud. Everybody got that? All of this has Linda feeling good about herself in an upbeat opening number kind of way. What are you doing? Stop that! Sin number one is the opening number, all signs point to yes. I hate it when a trope I normally enjoy gets used terribly, as is the case here. This is not how you do found percussion. There is way too much going on. Look at cell block tango. It starts with a dripping faucet. Then a footstep. Then drumming fingernails. Now the tango rhythm is coming through. And by the time the lyrics start in, we've got a good beat going. Nothing too complicated. But here we've got crickets chirping and doves cooing and some kind of oat coffee thing and traffic and sirens. And would you all quiet down so I can hear the music? Not that there's much worth hearing, the song is trying to paint Linda as a quirky, lovable, visionary go-getter, but it makes her feel like a bad knockoff of Anna from Frozen. At the Mogul Lab, company executive Evelyn is talking up Rice 9 to the press. It resists drought and pests and has as many nutrients as a steak dinner and probably also cleans your car in Julienne's fries. All well and good, but of course the obviously evil corporation has evil doings afoot in its obviously evil boardroom. Movie time, gentlemen. 
Well, no wonder the corporation is evil. It's run by President Snow. Mogul CEO Gergen is eager to corner the rice market in India, but there have been stumbling blocks. Apart from those gosh darn Indians not being too interested in white people coming in and telling them how to cultivate a crop they've been growing for about five millennia now, their sales rep has been getting drunk and sleeping with politicians' wives and generally bad PR all around. So Gergen makes the smart business decision of just selecting a new rep at random from his highly surveilled employees. Isn't it true you created this just so Mogul could patent and own it? No, we created it to help farmers all over the world. Yes, Linda is young, pretty, and innocently believes that her work is in the service of the common good rather than in enriching her employers, all of which have Gergen going, that's our Hitler! Linda is a bit skeptical at the prospect, though, as in addition to all of her other naive ingenue qualities, she's hardly set foot out of her own neighborhood. Which, when you consider she lives in the middle of one of the most diverse cities in the United States, is especially sad. But Gergen is threatening to cut lab funding if the Rice 9 sale doesn't go through, so one establishing shot of a plane later, she's getting her first glimpse of India. You know you're in a bad place when your movie is sending its white protagonist to India and her first reaction to the situation basically reads as, Oh no, there are so many brown people here! I can see why so many people found this movie insulting. The way the primary setting is treated is shallow and condescending. Linda's first experiences in India are an embarrassing play-up of how exotic and non-European everything is. Look, they have animals out in the open and everything! People actually ride in carts pulled by oxen! No motors! There's this thing where they wash your feet while waving a flaming coconut in your face, and they eat with their hands! How weird is that? This is a good example of why putting a white person at the center of your story about a non-white culture is a bad idea. It makes everything about their reaction to what they see rather than the culture itself. Not that there's much of the culture to speak of. For a movie that claims to be a love letter to Bollywood and India, there's very little of either involved. All the things you likely think of when picturing a Bollywood musical number, the large cast of dancers, the elaborate sets, the traditional costumes and dance moves, show up in this movie only briefly and in weak, half-hearted imitation. And don't expect anything about the history or culture of India either. For example, the second act of the film takes place during the lead-up to Diwali, a five-day festival of light that features luminous decorations, fireworks, and gifts and food with family, all of which barely feature in the movie itself. One character makes an offhand and highly oversimplified comment about the holiday being like Christmas, and a few characters go to a club and that's it. If you've seen that one episode of The Office, you know more about Diwali than this movie cares to show you. Basically, you could make this entire story about Linda selling corn to farmers in Iowa, and it wouldn't really change a thing. After Linda's whirlwind tour of Indian stereotypes, she arrives in the town of Bilari and is greeted by the agricultural office representative, a three-piece schmuck named William Patel. Um... Pardon me, you are Dr. Watt's assistant? Ah, yes, the good old you can't possibly be a doctor because you're a lady girl with female parts. Because if there's one thing India's never heard of, it's a woman doctor. William, as you can probably guess, is the Mr. Wrong in this love triangle the movie is establishing. Mr. Wright is a local boy named Rajat, who Linda met cute with on the train as they grabbed for the same cup of tea. Rajat was going to college, but the money ran out, so he's back on the farm and is really bitter about that. I can't believe I'm back to this! I... <sighs> At least the writers did have the sense to give the everything's all rural here and I hate it whining to one of the locals instead of the white expatriate. Speaking of, she's made herself comfortable at William's Crazy Rich South Asians compound and is touring the countryside via sin number three when tomorrow comes. And when's the moment night is followed by day? I'll take lyrics trying too hard to be profound for 800 whoever is making me miss Alex this week. 
Really, this entire song is just an excuse for more generic sitar riffs and Indians being Indian shots. The whole thing looks and sounds like a particularly bad vacation advertisement. Explore the exotic beauty of India without leaving the comfort of your air-conditioned vehicle. See locals hard at work in picturesque settings, doing things in a quaint, old-timey way. Maybe you'll see dancing, or this stern but wise-looking old woman just kind of staring at you. Pretend to get cultured with non-threatening travels, for people who want to see the world without engaging in it. Linda's ride breaks down and her phone has died, so she really has no choice but to actually get out of the vehicle and do some looking around on foot. At which point she encounters Rajat again, but fails to recognize him because he's right side up. Hello. Hi. Do you speak English? English? Yes, Lady Mim Sahib, I'm speaking English many. Uh, please, thank you. To be fair, he did greet her with hi instead of namaste, so it was kind of a dumb question. Nevertheless, Rajat wastes no time having a bit of mean-spirited fun at Linda's expense. Oh, is that for rice? No, it's for killing monkeys. Come, watching. I haven't seen any monkeys. It's good weapon. Somehow the parts where they make fun of Linda being bewildered and unversed in local life are even worse than the parts where they play it straight. Possibly because these parts involve the guy the movie is trying to set her up with and doesn't expect his actions to be a deal-breaker. William gets pissed off when Linda uses Rajat's joke head-slap greeting on a local elder as he really wants this mogul deal to go through so he can live in New York and make his father proud and stuff. Meanwhile, the next stop on Linda's Goodwill tour is a dinner with a local family, and you'll never guess whose family she's scheduled to meet. No, really, you couldn't possibly guess. That's him. That's the monkey hunter. Traditional family greeting. <gasps> okay, maybe you will guess. Linda is shocked to finally recognize the guy from the train and that she's been played for a dupe, but she gets over it to share her mad guitar skills with her hosts and walk under the stars with Rajat while discussing their favorite weeds. I'm not even joking. Edisarum geranus. That is my sixth favorite weed. Wow, that is so weird. Yeah. See, Rajat is into agriculture too and has a plan to raise money for college by selling stinkweed as a natural pest deterrent. Meanwhile, Linda is presenting her pest deterrent rice to the locals and almost immediately starts bombing. Did you really hit our town elder? Uh, it, it was a misunderstanding. It's not a promising beginning, but I'm sure that once she learns a little bit about the local people and their culture, they'll gradually... Mogul's got it all figured out with rice night. Even the stem beetles. Or she'll just instantly win them over, I guess. The ease with which Linda and her Rice Nine are accepted is bothersome enough on the narrative level, but this particular setting is what really makes it rub the wrong way. This is India. The fight against British rule is still within living memory. One of the many reasons this film didn't play well with Indian audiences is because the villain's tactics are uncomfortably similar to those faced by indigo farmers in the 19th century. Linda should be met with a lot more inherent and justifiable mistrust than she is. But because she's a nice white girl and is able to meet the low bar of not a drunken lech, she's welcomed with open arms. The only person who doesn't instantly trust Linda is Rajat, who quite rightly points out that a large multinational corporation isn't providing fancy GMO rice out of pure altruism. He convinces the farmers to avoid signing contracts with Mogul until they compare the Rice 9 test harvest with his own stinkweed-protected patties, which will occur the day before Mogul hosts a Rice Exchange Day where contracted farmers will trade in their old seeds for the new. So while Linda frets about not being able to get anyone to sign contracts, William flirts, Rajat glowers and argues with her, and they all have a big indie pop video together. Eventually, William reads the fine print in the farmer's contracts and discovers Mogul's angle. The grains produced by Rice 9 are sterile, meaning the farmers will have to buy fresh seed every year and essentially will be beholden to the corporation forever. 
He confronts Gergen with this information, but Gergen and Evelyn appeal to William's sense of materialism with sin number six, the greater good. When it comes to job creation, conglomerates can't be beat. You gotta loosen up child labor laws and get the kiddies off of the street. This does have some elements that would make for a good villain song. I can't say no to some jabs at late stage capitalism. But here's the problem. You have Time Daly, who can sing. Rising tides will lift us all. The greater good from the rice field to the mall. And then you have Donald Sutherland, who really can't and just talks his way through the part. It's the premise and the promise of the trickle down system. The greater good. Either of these approaches, by themselves, would be valid for the song. But when you put them together, it's not good. Start working for the greater The song also goes through way too many genre changes, from soft shoe to country to disco, I guess. And we can rest with easy conscience, knowing everything we've done. Bottom line, William decides to sell out his home and country for the sake of expensive scotch, a transfer to New York, and a nice cowboy hat. He takes Linda out dancing to celebrate, while Rajat and his sister Sita, who, by virtue of being the only other woman between the ages of 18 and 50 in this movie, has been designated as Linda's friend, sneak in through the back way. So Linda gets to see Rajat being adorably awkward and learn some basic Bhangra moves from Sita. All in all, it's hardly the club from In the Heights. Here, it's hardly the trailer for In the Heights. Nobody's signing the contracts. I don't know why. It's, I've been losing sleep over it. Oh yeah, did I mention Rajat set up this so-called contest between himself and Linda without involving her? Why is this movie going out of its way to avoid any real plot conflict? Anyway, Rajat can't bring himself to come clean, but he does get to slow dance with Linda until William bribes a bouncer to have him thrown out. And before he can get around to his confession, Linda just happens to stumble onto the whole affair. Stinkweed, Linda. Diwali, lousy stars. Violence is not the answer. It depends on the question. These are for you. But it turns out that Linda's rice did outperform Rajat's, so everyone's signing with Mogul now, and Linda learns Rajat just wanted to go back to college, so everything's okay now between them, I guess? At least until they start fighting again? And then Rajat starts singing a love song to her? But all I am, I'm just a man who has loved you from the start. I've just realized something. If you take all the tired, overused romantic comedy beats and mix them up at random, they're still tired and overused. Especially when the couple's attitudes towards each other keep bouncing between extremes. For example, Rajat and Linda are making nice now, but it's only a matter of time before Rajat learns Rice Nine is sterile and believes Linda has betrayed his community, even though she couldn't possibly know. You don't plant the rice that you harvest, you eat that, and then you plant Rice Nine seed. Which we're expected to buy from Mogul every time we plant? Naturally. Or maybe she's known all along and fails to see why this might be an issue. <sighs> We come now to the main question before this court, namely, does Basmati Blues promote white saviorism? The answer is yes and no. You don't have to squint to see the elements of the trope in play here. Linda's goal is to save the benighted poor people of the world through the power of science. She goes to India to pursue that aim with no knowledge of or input from the local community, who nevertheless accept her assistance with disturbing eagerness. And, as we will see shortly, she spearheads the movement to stand up against the villains in the climax. On the other hand, Linda's actions are shown to be a Trojan horse for corporate colonialism, which is kind of a subversion. But I think where Basmati Blues really fails as a white savior narrative is that the would-be savior is clearly the stupidest person in the entire movie. So Linda doesn't know anything about traditional Indian greetings or dining etiquette, Fine. Honestly, that probably puts her on the same level as a lot of visitors to India. 
but she's an agricultural engineer. She has a doctorate in this field. She has ranked her favorite weeds for Lucifer's sake. High on the list of the things she should know is how farming works. And this is neither the time nor the place to discuss the pros and cons of GMOs, but by this movie's simplistic old ways good, new ways bad standards, Linda's blind spot here is especially baffling. If your life goal is to improve agricultural practices to make them more productive, shouldn't you start by knowing what those agricultural practices are and if your solution is the slightest bit sustainable? Anyway... Rajat is obviously infuriated and does his own research with the contracts and Mogul's super condescending promotional video. But before he can act on this information, William has him arrested and framed for trashing Linda's lab. So the rice exchange goes on as scheduled as the villains gloat and Scott Bakula decides to show up again, and Linda decides to visit Rajat in prison just because. I've been terrible to you, but when I'm with you, I feel... I... If I had a hundred Um, Rajat, I'm not here to tell you how to conduct your romance, but maybe lead with I was framed and Mogul has been using you to dupe farmers into eternal debt instead of the love song? Stop no. flying. I don't even know why I came here. I don't know why you did either. What was the purpose of that scene? But Linda has started having doubts, and even Gergen's, of course the farmers know what they're signing up for, don't be ridiculous, fails to placate her. And by the time she's called up to speak at the big rice exchange to do, she's gone completely off the rails. What a weird guy. He doesn't like the Taj Mahal. <laughs> mm. Finally, finally... Linda tells the farmers that Rice 9 seed needs to be bought every year and realizes they did not in fact know that and the implications of what she's done finally hit her. Gergen's attempts to silence her are only briefly effective and she leads the farmers to get their old rice back. Luckily, the local cops side with them, one of them even unlocks Rajat's cell, and the train has been stalled by William, who has had a change of heart because... Something, something, his father, I don't know. Rajat and Linda were changing their attitudes every scene, so he probably felt left out. But hey, what's an evil corporation without some hired armored goons to enforce their will? How will our heroes ever... Gergen and Evelyn have got the train moving, but Linda uncouples the rice cars while her dad and William burn the contracts. Which of course Mogul doesn't have any copies or other records of, don't be ridiculous. Rajat, meanwhile, has made the questionable choice of trying to stop the train by parking his car across the tracks. Linda tries to tell him his suicidal action is unnecessary, but he doesn't listen to her because nobody listens to anybody in this movie because... Your stupid minds! Stupid! Stupid! <laughs> the farmers get their rice, Rajat and Linda get each other, and Mogul probably has the patent on Rice 9 and lots of markets that don't have idealistic scientists fighting for them, so they're probably fine taking the L on this one. And finally, we get a group dance number that is definitely not worth sitting through the rest of this movie for. If it hadn't been set in India, Basmati Blues would have just been a formulaic romantic comedy, albeit a badly written one. But because it is set in India and claims to follow in the spirit of Indian cinema, it has all the boorish insensitivity of a rude tourist barging around on vacation. The producers, director, and writers had no real interest in the culture they were presuming to appropriate, so through a special cross-theological arrangement, this court condemns them to be reincarnated as rice weevils. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>